Do you want to find out what the experts in distilled spirits businesses have to say about managing and operating a distillery? Well, you should check out the Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. It's a six-course online program taught in part by real corporate fellows, meaning that you're getting real experience from the experts at the most renowned distilleries, companies, and startups in the industry. We're talking leaders from Brown Foreman, Jack Daniels, and so many more. Get enrolled right now to this fully online program at uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. There's a new award-winning four-grain bourbon that's been taking the market by storm. It's Penelope Bourbon. Bottled at the historic Castle and Key Distillery, Penelope's balanced yet flavorful taste profile comes from a unique blend of three bourbon mash bills. It's currently available in two expressions, 80 proof and cash strength. It fits your mood whether you're sipping neat or in a cocktail. Penelope is available in select markets as well as online at penelopebourbon.com. Are you looking for an app to track your tasting notes and bottles, but also connect with other bourbon drinkers? The Oak Bottle Tasting app uses powerful analytics to suggest new spirits for you based on your reviews and the tasting notes that you enjoy. Explore the feed to like and comment on the tastings of your friends, distilleries, and verified tasters. With over 250 different tasting notes, recording your own tastings has never been easier or more accurate. Join the fastest growing community of tasters today. Search for Oak Bottle app on the Apple App Store. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. you can't tell that they're family, right? <laughs> by, by looking at them. They're, it's like you've got three different versions of Ted. <laughs> <laughs> This is episode 275 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. Before we start today's podcast, talking to the fine folks at Starlight Distillery, here's your weekly bourbon news update. Starting on October 16th, Elijah Craig will host a lineup of live activations designed to be both educational and entertaining to generate support and funds for the Restaurant Workers Community Foundation. Consumers and hospitality professionals can register and create their own online schedule events at oldfashionedweek.com. The first 250 people to register will receive an Elijah Craig home bar kit, and the first 500 will receive Elijah Craig socks. And everyone who registers will receive coupons to celebrate the week accordingly. The schedule of events include the Old Fashioned Bar Trivia with Heaven Hill Distillery Ambassadors Bernie Lubbers and Jack Choate. The Art of Crafting Ice with Portland-based bartender and author Jeffrey Morgenthaler and Elevating Your Home Bar with Devin Kennedy and Bartending at Pouring Ribbons. The Kentucky Bourbon Festival is taking place virtually and the first events are starting on October 15th. So with over 20 events over four days, you're bound to find something you're gonna like. You'll find master distillers and other guests of the show sharing the virtual stage. Go to kybourbonfestival.com to get registered for all the free sessions, and you can get a VIP experience as well for $150 that includes glassware, collectible poster, and much more. Now moving on to bourbon release news. Penelope Bourbon is releasing its rosé cask finish, one of the first bourbons to be finished in a French rosé wine cask. This limited release production is capped at 2,400 bottles and is bottled at 94 proof. Penelope's Rosé Cask Finish will be available in mid-October of 2020 at online retailers including Sealbox, Mash and & Grape, and Flaviar with select liquor stores nationwide with an SRP of $65. Now, today on the show, we are talking to the Hubers, a generational family business built around wine, spirits, hayrides, apple picking, and lots of other farm-related things. But all kidding aside, before we get to the podcast, I have to tell you about an exciting new partnership between Pursuit Spirits and Starlight. We've been blown away by their bourbon and rise, so much so that we are going to be releasing products by Starlight as Pursuit Series releases. Our first two barrels will be ready in December. The first bourbon will be in episode 35 and has a scent of mulling spices and pretty much everything fall. The second barrel is a bourbon finished in Apple Jack brandy casks. And when Ryan and I tasted them, I said fig, Ryan said dates, and we actually ended up having to Google what the difference was between figs and dates. We're very excited to begin this partnership and to release more barrels from Starlight and the Hubers in upcoming months. Make sure you go to PursuitSpirits.com to keep up with all of our releases. Now onto the podcast. We're joined by Ted 
Christian, and Blake. And we talk about the family history on the farm that led them to have DSP IN31, which if you know your DSPs, your distilled spirits producers, that's a super, super low number. We take a few twists, but there is one thing that we came away with, and that's how this family never settles with a single recipe, a single barrel entry proof, a single cooperage, or even a single distiller. These three take turns at the helm, steering their bourbon in a new direction. And after recording, we went to the warehouse and tasted maybe 12 or 15 different barrels, and not one or the two were ever alike. So make sure you try a single barrel selection, and you'll know what I'm talking about. We just released and sold out of our Barrel Bourbon Private Release Series. These are Kentucky whiskeys where the largest component is an 18-year-old whiskey, and they're all finished in different types of single barrel casks. Now, we may have sold out, but you can get this whiskey finished in a Takaji barrel or in a cask formerly used for Barrel Rum's Tale of Two Islands right now on BarrelBourbon.com. With that, enjoy today's episode, and here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. I've been doing whiskey stuff for a long time, and over the years, I've received a lot of incredible uh, media kits and packages. Uh, probably the best over the years has been the Orphan Barrel series, where they sent you like a little box, and they put a watch in there, and it, it opened up like it was a book, and it was really, it was really cool. It was really nice. Recently, I was reminded of how much I hate frou-frou boxes and all that when it comes to a media sample. Now, I realize this is an extraordinarily first-world problem, and I'm not really complaining about it, but give me a second. Bear with me here. I'm not, I'm not in a moment of saying, like, oh, I get all this free stuff, you know, and it sucks. I'm not saying that at all. I, I love what I do, and, I, and it's great, and... I, I cherish the fact that uh, people send me samples and uh, are respectful when I say I don't like their whiskey. So uh, I want to tell you about a brand called Fistful of Bourbon. It came with a, a bucket of popcorn. It came with T-shirts. It came with uh, all kinds of stuff. It was just you can go on people's Instagrams and see uh, and see the media kit that they sent. I also bought a bottle for twenty four bucks at Total Wine and. I opened up both of them, tasted both of them. The whiskey absolutely sucked. And I just look at the amount of effort and money that went into the design of the label, that went into the design of the package. And I'm like, why couldn't you all have spent the money on better whiskey? Because this sucks. And I, it just reminds me over the years, thinking about all the times I've gotten fancy packages from people, usually the whiskey is like really, really bad. But whereas like, you know, Buffalo Trace, Buffalo Trace and like, you know, Wild Turkey, you know, and, and these companies that have really great like whiskeys, like Four Roses, they just send they just send me a little sample in like a box. They don't need to fluff it up and say, look, look at how good and pretty our design is. They let the whiskey talk for itself. And I wish more brands would do that instead of focusing on. Uh, the packaging for for media. Take that little hundred thousand dollars that you spent on there, and maybe see if you can get a few barrels that could help ameliorate that particular product. Because you want the whiskey to speak for itself, you don't want the box to do it for you. And that's this week's above the char. Hey, if you have gotten a package over the years that's kind of cool, take a picture of it and tag me on Instagram, and I'll comment on it. Just search for my name, Fred Minnick. Until next week, cheers. Welcome back to the episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. And this time, Kenny and Ryan traveling up north for once, not in Bardstown, not in oh. Frankfurt. We actually came to uh, cross the border up into Indiana. Yeah, we typically, this is our first northern trip, though, that I can think of. It actually is. We are, we're usually going down south for a lot of these trips. Yeah. And this one kind of... Well, I made this trip a lot of times, so... Yeah, we're, I was about to we're, say... We're familiar with it. I, so the, the guests that we're going to be talking about today, you know, this is this is kind of like a staple in Louisville that people know. It's like an easy getaway. You go around with the family, you go to the farm, you know, pick some strawberries, have a good time, you know, drink some sangria on the back porch while you're listening to some tunes. And this was something that, you know, I we had all been here 
plenty of times before. And I know I talked about, well, I've talked to our guests uh, previously when we were doing this. I was like, you know, I, I tasted their whiskey, you know, a few years ago. And I was like, yeah, you know, it's, it's on the right direction. And then all of a sudden there was a lot of social media that were kind of like really hyping and building this up. And I was like, okay, well, let's go see what it's all about again. And I got introduced to uh, one of our guests today by one of the purchasing managers at Kroger. And he was like, hey, let's go and taste some barrels in the warehouse. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, Sure, I could. I can get away from that to go do it a bit. And I was blown away, completely floored by the whiskey. I mean, it completely had uh, changed and changed for the better. And I'm just, I, it's like I said, I'm super, super excited to talk about our guests from the uh, that other Indiana distillery. That's right. Yeah this this place Huber is where we're at. I mean, I've been I was talk, talking to our guests about. I've been coming here for years as a kid, field trips family getaways it's like a field of dreams you know you build it you would come it's like who would think you'd come up to an hour away from louisville and come hang out at a farm all day but it's everybody loves it i love it my kids love it my wife really loves it she loves it too much so she's like one of your best customers so <laughs> dragging me up here on sundays for my missing my football but that's okay i love it it's a good time so love sitting on the patio having the you know sangria the wines and listening to some music but uh yeah i'm I'm excited about the bourbon because, uh, like I said, it, we're 45 minutes away. So if, you know, another great distillery that close to us, it's a home run for us. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and introduce our guest today. So on the show, we have three gentlemen from Huber's Winery, also Starlight Distillery. It's all part of the Hubert Orchard Incorporated. So starting on our left, we've got Blake. He is a current graduate and of Cornell and going into a, he's somewhat of an intern going into full time. We're still trying to debate that <laughs> yeah. um, as we're going into this. They're working through his title. <laughs> <laughs> we've also got Christian. He's the production manager for the wine and spirits and plan operations. And we've got Ted. He is the president of all Hubert Orchard Incorporated, the Orchard Winery, the distillery, and also the current master distiller here. So gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. you can't tell that they're family, right? <laughs> by, by looking at them. They're, it's like you got three different versions of Ted. <laughs> <laughs> so there was one thing that we always want to start the show off with, and that's just like a kind of fun icebreaker. So I'll kind of ask the question to you. Would you rather be an astronaut or an Olympic gold medalist? An astronaut, astronaut for sure. As you say, yeah. Okay, so go on. Why, why an astronaut? Well, the three of us are, are, are really science geeks. We love, we love science uh, as the two boys and myself. That's what we love to do when we get into the distillery or the winery or even the agriculture producing what we do. We, we always take a scientific approach to about everything. Uh, and then we, we round it up with a little bit of art and fun. So I, we all have mentioned that exactly at the same time, oddly enough. Or they hate exercise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a little bit of both. Just kidding. Yeah, but not all astronauts get to go to space, though, do they? Huh? No, but oh. they get they get to work on the science side. Of that's it. true. So, yeah. That's yeah. very true. Yeah, that's we love true. we love we love science and we love math. Oh, uh, there you yeah. go. So, um, unless it unless it's an Excel spreadsheet, it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> what about you, Ryan? Olymp Olympic gold medalist? Yeah, or an astronaut? yeah, I mean, I like science, but not all day long. So uh, probably, but I don't know if I want to be training all day either, <laughs> man. So. Uh, maybe a, I'll do Olympic athlete, maybe like rifling or archery or something where I don't have to run all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I was thinking. Maybe Olympic athlete. And I was thinking maybe like curling. Yeah. Like, curling. Be good. <laughs> I mean, this is like, solid. yeah, you just grab a beer afterwards. Like, that's fine. It's yeah. just, a, that's just like a, like playing cornhole in your backyard, but I'm in on that. See. All right. So let's go ahead and we'll kind of, uh, you know, really dive into it. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about, you know, you all first kind of talk about the family the winery, the distillery, like how did this all kind of start? Because I know that, and this is the one thing that I mean, Ryan doesn't know about. And I found out last time I was here when I was looking at some of your barrels, it's, it's DSP IN 31, right? I mean, that's a, that's a low, low number. Mm -hmm. And cause I remember DSP KY 31 is heaven Hill. And I'm like, mm -hmm. IN 31. I was like, wow, that's, that's super low. So I know that you all have been around for a while. So kind of talk about some of the history that, that led up to today. Okay, I'll take that one because a lot of the history goes back further than the boys do with the distillery. So we actually were founded uh, back in 1843 by Simon Huber, who carries the name on our gin. Uh, him and his son Ignatius came over from Germany uh, to establish a winery, distillery, and fruit farm as what we were for se seven generations in Germany. So south of Baden-Baden uh, along the Rhine River is a large fruit growing area. 
Hence the fact that we were started as a winery and a brandy producer back uh, in the 1800s. So they were looking for the perfect piece of ground. Uh, they settled around this area in the 1830s, but bought the farm that we're standing on in 1843. Uh, and then established uh, established vineyards and orchards. Those were their two first things that were originally planted. Uh, and if you know the history of alcohol, you know that brandy was consumed far more than whiskey in the 1800s. And if you know the history of the area, apple brandy was the big producer. And this particular region in southern Indiana is the apple brandy producing area. Uh, and if you look at Laird's up on the East Coast, you would know how popular they were back in the in the 1800s also. So, you know, that's that gets our that gets us started in what you see when you look out these windows that we're in this building right here. You see all the orchards, all the vineyards, blackberries, and all the fruit being grown on this farm, which is kind of unique to this particular area and people think of indiana as corn which you can think of corn as bourbon and so forth but you don't think of indiana as being as large a fruit producer as it would have been in the 17 and 1800s which uh and people don't realize that indiana also was the largest wine producing state for over 100 years back in the late 1700s into the 1800s so uh, there's a rich history here in southern indiana when it comes to brandy production and wine production uh, and then we had several different problems in this particular region. Uh, one was the Great Blight of the late 1800s and then Prohibition. Uh, and those two pretty much wiped Indiana out and off the map when it comes to producing alcohol uh, at that particular time. And it wasn't until the 1970s that my father and, and his brother, uh, Carl, were able to go ahead and get the winery started. They were working with some legislators and other people in Indiana that really wanted to see the wine industry be reborn. Uh, and so in the early 1970s, that happened. Vineyards were reestablished on this property, and then the Huber Winery came to existence. And that went really well. And then uh, around the late uh, 1980s, early 1990s, people know the Marcella name as our number one selling wine, Sweet Marcella. Uh, that would be my oh, yeah, grandmother. That pretty good. Yeah, a lot of people know that in this market. Uh, that's my grandmother. And grandma kept kind of prodding me in my late uh, mid-teens about bringing the distillery back and getting our apple jack or apple brandy uh, production back going. Uh, and I was still kind of in high school, but uh, my love of science and, and production and fermentation, she could tell. And so she was really working hard on that. Uh, and so we started pursuing it, doing a little research, a little development, and a little uh, kind of hidden in the back room of the winery, a little distillation process going on, kind of learning from things uh, about that particular time. And so the, uh, things went really well with that particular project. But the big hurdle for us was to get the laws changed in Indiana, because as we know, the big distillery here in Indiana, MGP up there, that time was Seagram's. Um, we didn't want that type of distillery. We wanted guests to visit us, tour us, taste with us, enjoy cocktails out on the patio. And and the whole experience, the Huber, uh, we wanted to make sure our distillery had that same experience as you would with the winery or the farm. Uh, and with the current license that Indiana had, that could not happen. Uh, we would just be a production factory, not a not an actual tourist distillery. So it took us several years from, we really started working hard on about 1998. It wasn't until 2001 that the um, things lined up for us legislatively here in Indiana, and we got the brandy law passed. And people wonder why we made brandy before we made whiskey and how all that happened. Well, the legislators felt very comfortable with the winery, comfortable with the history of brandy in the state of Indiana, and comfortable with uh, how wineries operated. So they figured that, you know, brandy's just distilled wine. So that can't be that big a deal. So our first license was brandy only what was the law talk about what was the law that you said was in place that only allowed seagrams or mgp to produce yeah, or whatever? Uh, that's that's the a, a different distillation law than so mgp and and starlight distillery actually operates with different license our license allows us to be able to have tours tastings cocktails and spirits to go home with customers uh, if you go to MGP, those do, those do not actually exist on their license. Gotcha. So we actually have two different licenses. And actually, when you visit Starlight Distillery and you take the tour, you actually see two different licenses because uh, we run two different distilleries. We have um, the Brandy Distillery and the Whiskey Distillery, and they are actually two different licenses on our property. Now, they do basically the same thing. 
But our brandy license being a little bit older, we did not want to relinquish that license and operate just under the current license. There's a few restrictions as far as production and quotas that the grain distillery has that the brandy distillery does not. I think so, one thing we missed in your title was also lobbyist. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's been, uh, my father taught me that back in my uh, in my early teens. And the boys actually in their early teens uh, have testified uh, in front of our public policy in House and Senate uh, in the state house many, many times when they were still in high school and even middle school, um, talking about the distillery and expanding it. And we always want to put a fresh face, uh, to the legislators to say, Hey, this is, you know, we're looking for multi-generational companies here. These aren't something that's going to open up and close 10 or 15 years later. These are businesses that can be established with a lot of, uh, a lot of capital input, uh, in business and building. So, Without the right license and operational, that people aren't going to invest the time and energy and capital into the type of facilities we're sitting in here right now without good good laws to uh, to work under. So yeah, so yeah, lobbyists. That's you know January and February. That's when Indiana's kind of hot on legislation. It's slow time here on the farm. It's <laughs> <laughs> a lot being kind of worked in. So you're banging down Capitol Hill. Oh uh, yeah, we have, sometimes twice a week running up to to Indianapolis. Very nice. So you had the the brandy that your farm was originally doing, correct? And then why did that production stop at some point? Uh, the brandy's still going on. That we still have a lot of acres of grapes and apples, uh, and some other fruits. Very minor. We do blackberry. We do strawberry. We do peach and all these other brandies. But very limited production. Uh, grape and apple are the two big ones. That's what we did a lot in the 1800s, uh, and that's what we grow a lot of. So that's our largest production. Uh, in that and then uh our gin came about uh because if you think of brandy brandy's you know distilled wine or distilled fruits and uh, fruits have seasons uh and fruits don't store very well so you know we don't have brandy production 365 days a year like we would with grain that we can store easily and and have uh and so during the winter time when we finish with apple brandy then that's when the still that's typically used for brandy uh gets used for gin uh, and so that, that, that's still, you know, brandy's still nowhere close to whiskey production. You know, America was a brandy drinking culture and now we're a whiskey drinking culture. So our brandy sales are do really well, good in competitions, uh, and have great respect nationwide. Uh, but sales are nowhere near bourbon or rye whiskey. That's the two big categories that we do right now. And when you do a tour of Starlight Distillery, you'll see both dis both distilleries and see the size of the brandy versus the size of the whiskey. Uh, and the brandy distillery is tucked in the winery. So it operates as part of the wine program. Uh, because again, we're fermenting wine ferm and pressing apples and pressing grapes. So it made good sense to have the brandy distillery focused in with the wine team. And the, so the wine team and the distillers in the winery are part of, you know, they may, may be making wine and brandy on the same day at the same time. We'll talk about like going from transitioning from making brandy to whiskey. What are some of the hurdles or learning curves that you kind of had to face when doing that well let blake, blake i'll let you take that one because the science uh you know there's a lot more science in brandy production than whiskey production so in fermentations and etc so when it was time for us to move into whiskey it was actually easier easier uh uh than you would think moving into it yeah so when when you kind of look at the difference between like a brandy production and then the whiskey side of things the whiskey production brandies you really want to grab what the essence of that fruit that you're distilling and the fermentations that go on with that matter a lot because you're trying to produce these fruity esters. You're trying to really gain a really clean fermentation because when you're making that distillate, you don't want a bunch of oils that are going to kind of cloud and kind of make the mouth feel too chewy. And you really want to, instead of going into a charred oak barrel, for a lot of our brandies, we do the more traditional European style going into toasted oak barrels. And so... When you don't have the char versus the toast, then you have less of this kind of fining that goes on. You have less room to hide behind, basically, in those barrels. So when you're trying to make high-quality brandies, the cuts are much different, and they're much higher. So you still want a lot of these congeners, which are your aromatic compounds coming through, 
but you don't want to run it too far down and you want to make these precise cuts have the redistillation to really kind of as i mentioned before grab that essence of what that fruit is and kind of really amplify that to complement what's going on when we do our aging and our toasted oak we also do an a different style as well where we make applejack that more traditional american style that's in charred oak barrels but at the same time you still want to amplify that apple character within there and that kind of uh kind of spice characteristic and it's almost like making an apple pie in that s because you're gaining some of these sweet vanilla notes you have that apple you have some of those spices coming through and so you just really want to put those all together to make one complete product in the end and then when you think about whiskeys is it's a much different kind of thing because you look at wine fermentations, you look at what goes on in distilleries, you see, you go to some distilleries, you see open top fermentations, you go on tours, you can dip your fingers down and everything. And as a winemaker, you're kind of, kind of a little bit <laughs> shivering just because you think about this because a lot of things can go wrong. You see in wineries, we hate things like Britannomyces, which is a yeast that can cause these barnyard aromas. Your fermentations don't start cleanly, acetic acid bacteria, which get those vinegar aromas, nail polish remover, all those things that if you don't have these clean fermentations for brandy, when you think about distillation, you're basically just condensing what you have there. You're distilling that, and at a certain point during that distillation run, there's going to be the boiling point of that particular compound, and that's all you're going to taste right there. So there's a lot of people that sometimes wine can go wrong, and they're like, oh, can you distill this to make a product? And sometimes <laughs> it's just so much there that there's really nothing that you can do just because you're just amplifying that, and it's just... You had vinegar before, but now you have a concentrated <laughs> vinegar aroma at that point. But as I mentioned, then you look at the fermentations, the distillation side of things, they're much quicker. There's a little bit less of this kind of fine tuning that's going on there. You still worry about temperatures. You still want clean fermentations as well, but there's less of this kind of worry within there with going with all of what's going on through there. And then the whole distillation process as well is different because a lot of the times for distilleries we're making a little bit different cuts within there we're garnering what's going on there so that corn sweetness that rye spice that softness of the wheat and the barley the nice maltiness coming from the malted barley and so well and important to mention to our closed top fermenters and our sweet mash fermentation if you want to dabble on that yeah so kind of drawing from our wine side, being winemakers, being the brandy side of things before we were actually uh, distillation of grain products, we really took some of that knowledge from our making of the brandies and our wine into what we do in our distillery now. So Christian mentioned we don't have open top fermenters. We're keeping it closed top a very sterile environment, and that helps us run sweet mash every time because we're – when you run sweet mash, you have a lot of concerns, microbial and different fermentation parameters that goes on. And there's a lot of different variables that if things aren't done correctly, if you're not cleaning your tanks every single time, you're not worrying about fermentation temperatures, you're not kind of monitoring the yeast progress, things can go wrong. And then if you kind of turn your turn a blind eye to it for a while, that can come out to be something that's very wrong in the end. And so, yeah, we're not back setting into our mash to kind of lower the pH for a more stable. So a lot of different things that go wrong. But that can, knowledge that we had from the brandies and wine kind of linked over. You can tell why it. they pick astronaut. Over. <laughs> <laughs> you sure you're an intern? <laughs> Man, you got a lot of knowledge there. Well, both of us, me and Blake, I mean, the first day we ever distilled by ourselves. I know it was my 13th birthday where he told me I could distill by my first my first time with no one else there. And I distilled Applejack brandy. And same with my brother. When he turned 13 years old, it was his first time distilling by himself. Um, so growing up in this industry and as a as a craft industry, when we were, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, that's whenever a lot of these major companies were forming their craft distilleries. Um, I remember Dave Perkins and Dave Pickerel being here on the property literally every other month um, as we're growing up in high school. With dad sitting on ADI and then following it to ACSA, um, these were the gentlemen and ladies with Lisa Wicker that were sitting down with us, that were talking with us and helping us understand these fermentations and building what we would be here in the next 10 
years. I mean, everyone asked us, where do we get our mash bills? And it was crazy because we had so much influence with really well-regarded distillers to help us get to that point. Um, so when we decide what Starlight was during our fermentations and our cuts and the chemistry behind it, each of us do it so differently. I mean, for my brother, I mean, you have a different yeast, you have a different mash bill. My dad, different yeast, different mash bill. Me, different yeast, different mash bill. We cook at different temperatures and we ferment at different temperatures and we make the still cuts at different points because we all prefer something a little bit more or less. I mean, everyone has their own palate. We talk about, you know, whiskey critics that talk about their touch points and everything, but everyone has their unique own palate. We all prefer different compounds over others. And so within Starlight, I mean, when I know you guys both been into our Rick houses, we make very different types of whiskey. I mean, there's so much interesting behind each and every barrel. Um, we do six different cooperages, uh, one to four chars, uh, plus we do toasted head and charred heads, and we have air seasoned wood from 12 all the way up to 60 month. Uh, so five year air dried wood, um, different entry points from 108 all the way up to 125. And we want to highlight certain compounds. We don't, we take more of the European, more if it's the, uh, what we call the classic like Japanese kind of whiskey style where we don't make the same whiskey over and over again. We make the best whiskey that day. So certain days, like I said, we bring more oils across the still and we're going to proof that down differently. We're going to go into a more charred oak or we get something that's light and delicate and has a nice rye spice. We might go into a two-year air dried Canton wood at a little bit like a 114 to 116 proof. But like I said, there's no... There's not a standard operating procedure. Every day is something new for us. And every day we're looking to make the best distillate for that fermentation and go into the best oak that that, that distillate should go into. Do you all each like take your own month? You're like, oh, it's my month, yeah. Blake's month or <laughs> Ted's well, month. Well, it's, been, it's been great for the last six, eight years because the boys have been in high school, out of high school, college, home for college weekends, et cetera. And... Uh, every time they would come home from college, they would kind of say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make this type of whiskey, make sure this is in the still house ready for me when I come home or. That's funny. Up. When I was in college, that was the last thing I was coming to think about coming <laughs> home. I'm like, I want to go distill something. It's like, I want to make yeah. a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was, that's been kind of fun. We have a great distillation team here. When you visit Starlight, you'll, and you take a tour through the plant, uh, we, you know, being a winery and being a distiller like we are, we're pretty much running almost every day, 365 days a year, uh, through with different types of wine or brandy or the whiskey production. So there's always something great to see. And the team that we have in place, uh, throughout the plant are very, very well educated and, and great guys that are, and gals, by the way, that are, are in our plant every day. I mean, we're, we love to be in the plant. We love to distill. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get to do it as much as we want to do it. Uh, so when we're talking here, we want to make sure that everybody does understand the three of us aren't making every barrel whiskey every day. Uh, we have a great, a great facility and a great team in the facility. Uh, and we get to do like holiday when, when the rest of the team takes off during the holidays. We get to come in the still house and run. Uh, really like, damn, they came in and messed everything up. Right? Yeah, that's that's pretty much. And they Ted have, came they, in and moved the yeah, dog again. Yeah, yeah. We have a Father's Day tradition about every year that uh, the Father's Day weekend, the three of us take over the plant and we run Father's Day bourbon or rye, depending on what we're doing, fun things like that. And then we get to play more. So like when Christian was speaking about different mash bills, different yeast, uh, different cut fractions, some uh, unusual barrels, uh, that's what we get to do. Uh, the rest of the team, you know, we're making rye. We're making rye for, you know, pretty much two months straight. Uh, they're making a little versions from that, but they're pretty much one to two mash bills that they get to operate under uh, and get to play a little bit between there. And then we get to come in on the weekends and play a lot uh, mm -hmm. uh, in that. So there's a lot less uh, uh, going on in the still house and the rick houses than what, what kind of was described. We're describing more of what we do as distillers. All right, so it sounds like you're submitting a, a lot of different labels to TTB with a much of, with all the variety that's going mm -hmm. on here. But you know, while we're talking about variety, let's let's grab one of these glasses uh, and kind of talk to us about. Uh, you have this one wax top over there. You want to mm -hmm. grab that one first, and we'll kind of just kind of talk us through what you had going on over here. All right, I'll start, and then let the boys take over from here because uh, this particular product falls under the family reserve. Um, and throughout the history on the whiskey side, not counting the brandy, but on the whiskey side, this was version number four. Uh, so if you think about uh, 20, almost 20 years of the distillery, uh, we've only released 
five altogether so far of family reserves. And in order to get this particular label, you have to get these three opinions together and all agree that this is something that we're willing to put our put our name on. Uh, so it gets a little more complicated. And currently right now in the Rick House of three, 4,000 barrels right now, we only have one that we are agreeing on and two possible that were up in the air. So these are very, very rare uh, products that the distillery actually releases. So I'll let Blake and then Christian. I mean, Ryan, we, we usually come to agreement on barrels pretty quickly, but not through. If we It took us 3,000 barrels to come on in one. We... I don't oh, think we'd gosh. ever get along. We, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Team turmoil. <laughs> yeah. Blake, over a little bit of uh, the history about the actual barrel that's behind this this blend, or this single barrel, I should say. Mm-hmm. Uh, so behind some of these barrels is when we're making some of these whiskeys in the future, like Christian said, every single day, every single weekend, we don't have the same kind of playbook we're going for. We're not trying to make a singular type of whiskey. We're trying to make the best whiskey from that particular distillate because as we mentioned, fermentations will be different. We'll have different grains coming in that's going to have different starch contents. You're going to have different conversion during the mashing process, difference in the fermentation temperatures. Depending on that week, it could be a cooler week. It could be a warmer week. And that's going to change the kinetics within there. And so that's going to make completely different whiskey from week to week so you can't come in and have a standard operating procedure that says here cut the still at 120 proof at this and take it over to the tails or redistill those tails there's never that kind of consensus coming in that we're going in and saying this needs to be this and that's what you're going to do you're going to proof it to 110 proof because each whiskey is going to establish itself and shine more different proofs different cuts and everything. And so when we are designing this particular whiskey here, we're going through, and this is a very special barrel that goes into these. And so there's, we only do probably about 10, 10 to maybe 16 of these barrels every single year. And it comes from a company that originates in France. And then they're in California where we actually grab these barrels from, and they're called Sagoon uh, Moreau. And these barrels are very very kind of niche in the bourbon industry in the bourbon market that we do because what they do there versus a lot of different companies is what the kind of french oak and the wine side of things that we see in our winery that don't happen in the bourbon industry is things like oak scanning happen to where they're looking at chemical composition of staves they're putting like staves with each other and they're putting certain profiles with each other to build a barrel that's going to be consistent and homogenous from year to year because as a winemakers we want to be able to replicate a lot of what's going on and that's the same thing as uh distilleries as well is we really want to have this assurance that we can replicate what's going on these aromatics that come from these barrels so when they're building this barrel they're looking at that thing so we want to boost sweetness so you think about wood sugars they talk about these all all the time and the lard reaction. So during that, if you toast the barrel and this barrel is toasted before it's charred, the toasting of the barrel, you're having that caramelization of that. As you get heavier in toast and as you char, you have this pyrolysis that happens as basically degradation of them, some things. So like vanillin's one of these, the vanilla aroma you get at high, high temperatures, that's actually decreased. But toasting that barrel or charring it for a long time, if they're getting deep into those staves, you're really producing a lot of that. It's going to really pull out that sweetness. And other things like... Uh, few for all, which are these caramel sweet characteristics that come through. These are all going to be amplified in a barrel like this to where we're looking at the char level. And I have to look back in the records. I think this was a char number three. It's So it was heavy toasted and then a char number three onto it. So basically kind of flash char, you're creating that kind of almost alligator skin on the inside. Mm -hmm. And then it's a really elegant barrel. And the whiskey that went into it was elegant as well, because we didn't want a lot of these fusel oils, fusel alcohols coming over that are going to cause it to be too husky, too grainy, that are going to kind of make it your mouth feel slick. We wanted something really characteristic. We wanted that sweetness 
of the corn shining through. We wanted the spiciness of the rye. We run high rye mash bills here. So that spicy characteristic. And once we put in this barrel, that sweetness and that real elegance of what that barrel is, is going to amplify that through. Right. And this was a collaboration barrel. We do several of these a year too, to where both teams get involved. Uh, so this was a collaboration between Jesse and Jason and us. Uh, Jesse running the grain distillery and Jason running the brandy distillery than us. So we got everybody involved when these barrels came in to be able to, we really wanted to reverse engineer this particular whiskey. We 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 actually flew to California and sat with Saguma Row for two days designing mm-hmm. these particular barrels and then had them shipped back. And we knew by the oak scanning and what Blake was talking about, all the different compounds within the barrel, then we reverse engineered the whiskey and made the whiskey. So Jesse and Jason and us, we all got together and we put together a really beautiful, beautiful spirit coming off. And this is weird because it was actually finished on the brandy still, mm-hmm. not oh, finished on the yeah. whiskey still. So it's actually ran through the plates on the on the brandy still uh, and finished, then put into this particular barrel. Is why we have a collaboration between the whiskey guys and the brandy guys. So it was a real fun project uh, that we did back then, uh, and we repeat this every year. So there are several whiskeys that every year that the brandy team, the whiskey team, get to do, and they're done on both both stills moving back and forth between the plant. Uh, and then special barrels are brought in and they're put together. And these typically, by the way, if you want to visit when we're doing these, these are typically done in late January, February, or March through those time periods when the brandy still is not on gin and we're wrapping up the season. And that way the brandy team and the wine, and the distillery team all get to kind of work together on making some fun whiskeys every year. Christian, you want to? Yeah, yeah, just jumping in real quick. Like the difference though between the brandy still and the whiskey still, I mean, the still shape and size of what a brandy still and a whiskey still is very different. And a lot of people around this region and around the Kentucky, like, whole valley, we've seen whiskey stills growing up, and we think that is what a still looks like. But brandy stills are very, very different. I mean, with a low wine column directly above the pot, you clean up your distillate a lot more than you do with your swan or goosenecks or your lyre arm going over to your low wine column for whiskey. Um, so when you do have pot distillation with brandies with a low wine column directly above, you're cleaning up whiskey a lot more. And so with a portfolio like this with the family reserves and the Sagu Monroe barrels, you want a really clean spirit. And that's why we choose to do it upstairs rather than down in our actual vendome. Uh, Christian Carls, like I said, very famous uh, cognac producer of stills, um, but it cleans up this little a lot more than what you would typically want in a whiskey. But with a very characterful barrel like Sagu Monroe, it fills that body up, the vanilla, the sweet, the lavalin flavors with it. Um, and it's seasoned wood. I mean, traditionally, we like to use a lot of air dried wood here because of that. Um, and a lot of toasted then flash charred because we want to pronounce the sweeter, fruity aromas. And that goes behind our winemaking and our brandy production. Um, so all of our cuts here are pretty decently high. Um, but especially for this portfolio though we want to keep it high we want to keep it fruity and we want to keep it very layered and complex and that's why we chose the brandy still over the whiskey yeah i was gonna say you need a standard operating procedure for this one yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. and this is just to recreate i mean it's got yeah, you we, know a lot of chocolate you know sweet vanilla notes like it's very like silky to me like almost it's had like an a, espresso at first for me yeah it's yeah. like real you know, like the deep mocha kind of flavors and then just the nice spice at the finish. It's right. very well balanced. Yeah, these are these have been fun projects. And when these projects are put forth, by the way, you end up what we end up with here. These are always cast strength and uh, unfiltered all, always. You're talking our love language. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this, I think, is 112.4 uh, uh, is what we finished this particular barrel came out at. So mm-hmm. uh, they're just going to come right out of the Rick House and tender loving care in our Rick Houses. And this particular barrel spent time in number one and then was finished in warehouse number two. Uh, and it was finished low in the corner of warehouse number two. So it was actually kind of medium to medium high in warehouse number one. And then once it hit the four years, it went to warehouse number two and was put down on the lowest rack system and then finished there for the more soft. And, and, and again, right, let's remember that yeah. <laughs> when we go over there, we know yeah. where the hot spots are. Well, and it's, it's just, uh, and, and Christian and Blake both mentioned the elegance of this particular one. It's very forward and, and, and but, but it's very elegant in the finish. And, yeah. 
Uh, and whenever you taste an elegant one like this, uh, a lot of times they're the ones going to be finished off of the brandy still. So that brandy still has a way of the, of elegant bourbon is, is a good mm-hmm. a descriptor that we use uh, here internally. Really cool. So I guess another question I want to kind of throw you, Christian. So mm-hmm. we had we had talked about, so A, like variety is the spice of life here. I mean, you can tell that everything that you have going on, you've got, you know, I don't know how many different kind of grains come in. You're doing all your different kind of mash bills, different yeast, different cuts. Different um, stills. Different, different stills. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the barrels for a second because you said that you were pulling from six different cooperages. Yes. So so what is the idea of going through six different cooperages? To enjoy whiskey, all one has to do is drink it. But to understand and experience whiskey, one must participate in its creation. And for over 20 years, the Thousand Oaks Barrel Company has been supplying kits to do just that, including personalized oak barrels, ranging from 1 to 20 liters in size, to custom age your own spirits or cocktails. But they now have their newest kit, called the Whiskey Experience. And this complete kit allows you to make, age, and taste your own whiskey. The whole package comes with a new American white oak barrel that's 1 or 2 liters in size and includes everything that you need to make 10 different styles of whiskey from around the world including American whiskey, Irish, Scottish, Japanese, and Canadian. So, are you ready to take the journey? Visit 1000oaksbarrel.com, which is number 1000oaksbarrel.com, and use code BP2020 to get 10% off your very own whiskey experience kit. Let's talk about ice balls versus ice cubes. It's all about physics, volume, and surface area. Did you know that an ice ball has 24% less surface area compared to the same volume of ice in a cube form? Well, less surface area exposed to warm liquid means a slower ice melt and less drink dilution without sacrificing any chilling power. And the coolest way to make ice balls is with a meltdown ice ball press. First, you take some ice and the provided silicone cups. You place this ice into meltdown and watch as the conduction from copper or aluminum melts the ice right in front of you. You can literally see the melted water cascade down the sides. And in a minute, you've got a perfect ice ball to put in your drink. Meltdown, it's the perfect solution to dilution pollution. You can use promo code PURSUIT to receive $100 off. So check it out now at MeltdownIce.com. Aged Denor is a small brand founded by two bourbon-loving brother-in-laws who design innovative products for whiskey lovers and their products have been featured by the likes of Food & Wine and GQ Magazine. The Travel Decanter is the best way to travel and bring your favorite spirits wherever you go. Visit agedandor.com to see their entire collection of products and stay up to date on upcoming launches this bourbon season. So what is the idea of going through six different cooperages? Now, I understand the grains because you're like, oh, I'm getting an heirloom grain. I'm getting a bloody butcher corn. I'm getting whatever. And, you know, you want to distill for that day. Yeah. But the distill- distillation doesn't equate to the type of barrel it might be going into. Or maybe it does. So kind of talk about the different, you know, vendors that you're going oh, yeah. through and why. Oh, for sure. And no doubt that I love barrels. I mean, me and my brother both did our senior thesis in Oak. I mean, that was, we studied barrels. And as winemakers, um, that's what you're used to is having multiple different cooperages at different toast levels because different forest and different places where the oak is actually grown has different compounds in it. And we don't talk about a lot of that in United States bourbon or rye production or even uh, malt production here in America. But in Europe, that's what they talk about. Different forests actually componently have different levels of different molecule, whatever it could be. Um so we've isolated certain, you know, certain compounds and certain flavor profiles in different cooperages. Um, as you know, there's very, a lot of people use Kelvin and we use Kelvin too. Um, but we prefer Kelvin chart number three and chart number four for the smokiness and denseness of it. Um, but when we want something a little bit more lighter and elegant, like a chart number one for Kelvin still isn't anywhere. It could be like a Canton chart four. And we're just looking at different different flavor profiles that you can build within it. And like I said, we don't make a lot of consistent whiskey. We make very like the whiskey best for the day. And when we're tasting these whiskeys, we all have different flavor profiles. And that's why we use like the toasted heads with Canton. Um, And we're building that flavor profile to blend. We're not looking for, you know, we don't pull row 26 to make Carlty. 
Um, we don't blend like that. A lot of houses around here do. You know, you take your four floor, when it hits certain age, it gets rolled out of this rick house and it gets blended with this and it makes whatever blended whiskey. But for us, we don't do that. We take different age whiskeys and different cooperages and we build what our Carl T is. Um, and that goes back into, like I said, the Scottish production of like malt whiskey or the Irish or going back into Japanese and definitely into the wine market where you take, you know, different age whiskeys and you're building this flavor, com- your flavor component of what a, what our blended whiskey Carl T is. Um, and like I said, and Blake can elaborate a little bit more on the. So, so with those, do you like say like this is the you know, different vintage, like similar to wine, like with your, you know, your whiskeys as well. Oh, for sure. And there's, when, when we talk about what Huber's is, I mean, we are a farm to bottle distillery. I mean, if you look out that window right now, you actually see some of the non-GMO corns growing up down the right, but it's totally different than the non-GMO grow up here on our east part of our property. Um, So different years, we have different like sugar to build up, different moisture temps and mother nature is like, she can be very nice to you. She can be very rude to you, but she's usually mean. Oh yeah, I'm in I'm in the <laughs> agriculture business too. Hell she's yeah. not nice, but no, not this year. <laughs> every year we have to constantly adapt. So like, there's some years where we're pretty corn forward, pretty sweet, but for us, we'd like to have nice rye spice, and we'll go and look for barrels that promote like have that spice to it. And so when we're building a flavor profile, we want to be able to choose not only like i said we don't do anything under four years i mean that's kind of the limit where we just start tasting it is at four but just because we have six and seven year old barrels doesn't mean we pick those as single barrels Uh, we don't have a single barrel mash bill everything could be a single barrel it's just we're building things to be able to make carl t and there is barrels we like better than others that we choose to do single barrels But when it comes to us, we're not row 26. This is all going to Carl T. We taste every individual barrel. I think yesterday we did, what, 40 barrels worth of tasting. And then every about two to three months, um, we're going to taste in a different row and being able to rate these whiskeys. And in our head, we're building this flavor component and we're building these different cooperages to highlight some of these different compounds. And I know... Blake, when you yeah, that, like, yeah Blake and uh, let's let Blake tell a little bit about the reasons for some barrels because we are when we're when we're doing certain runs certain times of the year um, we're we're buying certain barrels and incoming yeah. I'm the barrel buyer uh, and also the grain so when when grains here or brandy uh, let's just take an example for brandy brandies are going to be the ninety plus gallon traditional European style. When we started our dis- our brandy distillery, we did not want to make Armanac or Cognac in the United States. We wanted to make American brandy. Uh, and so we originally started with a smaller barrel. Uh, we started with the 70-gallon barrel. I think that's a nice wine size. We're, we're very familiar with that barrel in the winery. Um, and then we started playing with some more of the Cognac-style barrels, and, and it didn't take us long to figure out that we wanted to go a little larger barrel, kind of slow down the aging process and give us some more complexity. Um, the one thing we learned very quickly in the whiskey side is that we did not want to be a small barrel distillery. No. Uh, we did one experiment. Uh, <laughs> only took one. One experiment <laughs> with some 20s and 30s. They are cute. Uh, they are, are cute. cute. And they're, they're very easy to handle, too, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So it's good on your back and, you know, your upper body. And it just doesn't, you don't go harm hurting uh, at night and rolling around barrels all day. But we learned really quick that 53s were definitely what we wanted to do for our whiskey. You know, that was figured out a long time ago. And, you know, our, our humidity and our temperatures are are pretty much similar to what's going on in Kentucky too. Yeah, so we're up here in the hills and so forth, and good ventilation, good airflow, miserable uh, and, summers. Yeah, and 53, <laughs> yeah. 53s work very well. I'm not going to poo poo a twenty or thirty because they're working really good for other distilleries uh, around the U.S. But here in this part of the Midwest, 53s worked. Uh, so we figured that out a long time ago as far as barrel sizes, and uh, we've dialed our distillery, both brandy and whiskey, into the size of barrels. So I'll let Blake talk a little bit about the, you know, the when we're buying barrels and we're doing certain runs, why air-dried or non-air-dried, and why uh, two-year, three-year, or just kiln-dried. Yeah, well, and two, talk about how many different cooperages we use in the brandy still house the itself reason. for French oak. Here we go. More variety. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of variety that goes on. But the thing about oak in general and just the making of each company is no one barrel is basically going to ever be the exact same. 
you could have one stave that maybe came off a different pile and it could elevate that barrel to a different standard than the one that was made the exact same day and it has nine tenths of the same wood within it and that's just the nature of what it is it's because a tree 10 foot from another tree could be gaining more nutrients it could have a different growth pattern it could have seen more light during some stages and that piece of wood there that when they cut down that oak tree it's going to be greatly different than that same piece of oak that was only that other tree that was only maybe a couple hundred yards away from it from the exact same place and then you look at each and every cooperages, they're doing different techniques, how they're air drying them, how they're kiln drying them, the different standards that they have going on there. And their char levels is because maybe their timing on each and every one is going to be slightly different. If some of these companies, if you actually hand charm, if somebody's actually on there in the open flame doing that, it could depend on the person that day actually going through and charring those barrels. So there's a lot of different variables that can go on that are going to influence that. And like I said, each and every cooperage is going to make a special barrel for their regard and it's going to continuously evolve. And so for us here is during certain periods of the year, we've kind of tried to pinpoint different profiles within each one of the companies and each one of the cooperage that we use in order to better kind of serve some of the distillate that we have going on throughout the year. So here on the farm, we grow four varieties of non-heirloom corn. And so things like Bloody Butcher, Blue Hopi, uh, we do a white and then a yellow, a classic style yellow dent. But each one of those have different profiles from within them. Bloody Butcher will taste... We've tasted them throughout the years. We've continuously monitored some of those. And we like to keep some of the our corn varieties separate in our mash bills because we really want to see after four years, what is this adding? So it's almost like having this standard in a science experiment where you have this to the side. Okay, what is this corn offering versus this versus this versus this? So we have barrels out in our rickhouse that we can have a lineup of four glasses and each one could have the exact same mash bill which uh, depending on what we're running our four grain mash bill but one could be made with bloody butcher the next one with our white the next one with our blue and the next one with our yellow dent corn and if they went into the exact same barrel you can still tell the difference of the different corn varieties next to each other because they're going to have different contents within there we harvest them at slightly different times depending on where they're at on the farm looking at the moisture content and when the harvesting actually occurs and so that's when we're going through here and we're looking at these different corns and we've kind of found that some things work better in different barrel selections just because some need, I mean, something like a Bloody Butcher, it is a very heavy, dense corn. You have a lot of these fusel alcohols, very big and large in the mouth. And you might need something that's a little bit heavier char to filter through some of that, kind of give it that, round out some of that. If you put that in too soft of a barrel, it's just going to overtake whatever it has going on there because it's just going to be for too long. I mean, that's something that could age for maybe 10 plus years just to get rid of some of this like too huskiness, this really head first of corn within there in order to gain that elegance. Because when we're aging bourbons, I mean, on the scheme of the scheme of how bourbon should be aged is there's no specific time limit. If somebody says that a 20 year old barrel is better than a 12 year old, that's just a personal preference. And age is not always everything because not all bourbons are going to age the same. Not all barrels are going to age the same and not the distillate going into those because really what you want to see is over a period of time, you want to just see exponential growth. You want to see that barrel from year to year, just keep getting better and better and better. And these are qualities like aromatic, so that nose on it, you get it, the mouth feel on it, the finish, that retro nasal, it happens, the burn within the back. And so all those factors play into how a bourbon's aging and how we're going out and rating these bourbons. And there's going to be a certain time point within that bourbon's age. Who knows what that time point may be? It may be six years, it may be eight years, it may be 12 years, it may be 16 years. But it's going to hit this point to when it's going to be balanced. It has that right balance of aromatics. It has the right mouthfeel and everything. And then after that time point, you're going to hold on to that for a period of time. But then it's going to start condensing more and more. As you know, like we talked about, the hot of the hot summers, the cool winters. After that time point, maybe you're losing that balance within that bourbon that you achieved before. And some person might like it better once you get a little bit more intense flavors, you're concentrating, but maybe that bourbon's not as 
what I say is just kind of like I said, that balance stage. And maybe you've kind of dropped off to where it's still really good, but maybe something's overtaking it. Maybe you had that elegance of all those aromas coming together, but then as you keep going along, maybe something's sticking out a little bit more and maybe got rid of something that you really enjoyed in that bourbon yeah. before. So I got a question. Have you all thought about oh. like publishing your thesis? So like, <laughs> like everybody in the industry could I read know. it. Your professor's probably like, what the hell <laughs> <laughs> is going on here? These guys really like whiskey and oak. <laughs> well, I was going to say, Blake, you ran uh, Oak Trial at Cornell University about the on the GC. Oh, uh, yeah. I just did. I did a lot of like reading early on just to kind of see the different complexities on what's actually going on within there. What are barrels actually adding in terms of different things? And there's a lot of things out there, but the barrel matters a lot. There's a lot of aromatics and things that we actually describe in whiskeys. So these sweet vanilla characteristic, caramel, butterscotch any of uh there's different things like clove any of these spices some of those things are naturally present in wood and are actually formed through the toasting process and so that matters a lot because a lot of those things are going into that into that whiskey so looking at your barrel program and having a really consistent kind of view on what you're doing and as we mentioned throughout the year we're making different whiskeys as i mentioned the different corn varieties in different stages we're having different grains coming in it's continuously evolving and so we kind of know what works best with different barrel types because everything's going to be different. There's a lot of variables that go on, but we like to just kind of think about what we're doing at the time, what we really want to make, what is this offering for us? So then we can better kind of serve that whiskey down the road. Well, and going off that, we actually have different mash bills. A lot of people think craft industry, you're four, six, seven years old. We actually sit barrels back. Uh, we have a portfolio that we've been laying back for 25 years. And it's a very different barrel choice and it's a very different distillate choice that we put in that program. We have a program that we're setting at 12 to 18 as well. And then we have a program for our normal that's 7 to 10. And the barrel choice, the distillate, the way we distill, the way we ferment is totally different based off the choice where we want that barrel to be its best at that point. Um, and Blake was talking about the imbalance of whiskey. And a lot of the consumers right now, we think age is literally the everything right the higher the age the better everyone talks about give me that pappy 23 or give me this give me that but there's complexity where different mash bills will hit their peak um for instance i mean us three here we love whiskey i mean you have 200 something bottles of whiskey <laughs> never, never would we have could tell. Yeah. no but <laughs> yeah. curious what you got graded on those uh, thesis <laughs> yeah 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 we got uh yeah in our in our in our wine cellar we got a couple thousand bottles in our wine cellar and all Dang. the different whiskey so yeah we're staying uh, here tonight and the first one the first one we taste it is a prime example of a whiskey that was actually designed not to go great length. Uh, when you taste this first family reserve, you taste it, it's a six year. Uh, and it is really, uh, we feel, was maxing out. That's why we went ahead and pulled it and did it as a family reserve at six because it was it, the, the wood integration, flavor integration, and we we're starting to degrade a lot of the actual bourbon s itself the grains were becoming masked behind uh, all of the oak and it was getting too concentrated so that's why we decided as a family to make that a family reserve and pull it is there, that uh, I, that's a quick question is there a particular time of year where i know some distillers or what or, you know they'll say like you know coming out of winter or going into winter or what you know is when they're pulling it and you know finding where it's you know, the most balanced or whatever. Is there for is that the same for you all? Or is there is it doesn't matter? Some say it doesn't matter, some say yes, it does matter. I, I believe it does matter, but we have mechanisms within place being a very large winery that we are to be able to mitigate those. Uh meaning we have very large refrigerations, very large freezers that literally barrels I mean, we have two hundred barrels in twenty seven degrees. Uh, right now, and we're speaking in middle of July right now. So uh, there is uh, ways that we here, because of the size of winery that we are, that our distillery gets to gain from a lot of uh, a lot of things. Uh, and that's where your like your twenty something odd year portfolio is folding into. Or oh yeah, yeah, underground wine cellars oh, okay. uh, cool. for things like that. Uh, so uh, being the parrot company, being a very large agriculture company that Huber Orchard is, helps our distillery out immensely. Being have the amount of, uh, and I'll give you a fun story. Uh, we were we were putting farm to bottle on one of our labels, and the federal government TTB said we we have to have proof. 
that you're a farm to bottle. So I did a Google Earth and took a picture of literally 22 tractors and all of our farm employees one morning going to work. And here was this big parade of tractors leaving our tractor barn, going to our large farm and said, this is why we're farm to bottle. And they said, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it was very easy for us to pull that, yeah, we are a full grain to glass uh, distillery. Uh, and those kind of things that uh, being an integrated, uh, well-diversified company, uh, what you said about, you know, is that, yeah, but, you know, we can pull and cool barrels down and make winter in the summer and vice versa, make summer in the winter. Uh, and so, you know, that's that's just the being a small craft distillery and being a diversified company, we can do that. I think Very you cool. all have, a, you have another fun story too. And I remember Christian said this when it was a few years ago, back to the barrel thing, mm -hmm. when there was a surplus of corn, but uh, not a lot of barrels in the market. And you all were already on the list of Kelvin. And so you're able to get barrels. Kind of talk about what yeah, that was like. Again, that's fun to have a winery the size that we are and be an old of a company as we are. Uh, going back, if you think about when we were craft distillers, there was only 57 craft distillers in the entire United States when we started. Uh, we were 50, we were number 57. Uh, and so we, we knew each other and going all the way back to the 1970s, there wasn't a lot of wineries in the, uh, in the United States either. So when you go to look at like, uh, Independent Stave and Kelvin and some of these other companies around the area of making barrels, we were buying barrels in the 70s and 80s from these companies. Um, going way back. So our name is on their list going way back. And so they were allocating barrels during the barrel, uh, the barrel shortage to companies that were the oldest. Uh, even though we're tiny, uh, Starlight Distillery doesn't, I'm sure Jack Daniels puts more down in a day than we make in several years. Um, but, you know, we're a very old company uh, and been around for a long time and, barrel, and buying barrels that we were getting every barrel exactly what we wanted when we wanted it because we were, uh, you know, sometimes number one or top 10. It already pays off. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, so when it comes to Kelvin, we were some of the some of the very first Kelvin barrels. Uh, when those guys moved to this part of the United States, we started buying barrels from those guys originally. Uh, and they they were service in our accounts. And, and, and that's just, you know, that's one of the nice things, again, about being an older company. And, and, and kudos to those guys. And they were taking care of not necessarily just their biggest customers, but their most loyal customers. And we've been buying from them for 40 years. And they were giving us barrels the way we need needed them back then. Very cool. I got a question about grains. Uh gonna come from an agriculture side here. Um so like different corn varieties, you, you talk about different, you know, whatever flavor profile, sugars, whatever. How how about like fertility plans on different corn varieties and what kind of different manipulations you can do there? You want to take it? Yeah, yeah. You, Looks like no, all the hard questions go over here. Well, to <laughs> yeah, he's the lead scientist, right from Cornell. You know, yield, yields, yields, and concentration of flavors and sugars and all this stuff vary widely during varieties and varieties per year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, going into the wine side, people expect that. You know, you talk about this vintage and the sugars were this and flavor profiles were this. This Cabernet from this particular year, from this particular side of the hill was that great. And that's never really been talked about in distillation. Uh, a little bit in into brandies um, and people understand that a little bit. But when we get into whiskeys, that's really not a big topic. But uh, sitting here talking to you guys, uh, you understand what we're talking about. That makes a huge difference yeah uh we can taste you know because you can approach fertility for like yields or mm -hmm. you can approach it from quality and so yes. i'm just i'm so lost right now <laughs> well, <laughs> well and sit back and listen well we get a you know we can get these weird ass hurricanes uh yes. your listeners that are not uh from the midwest and louisville and around this area we actually can get hurricanes pushing our way up to the gulf of mexico and catching us in august september we call those drought busters oh yes uh -huh. and uh but they can really play hell on the corn uh, when we're doing these bloody butchers, these things are 12, 14, 16 foot tall, uh, big, tall uh, heirloom varieties. And, and these, these hurricanes that come in and hit the, uh, you know, the Texas area that can run up the Ohio River Valley and they can lay your corn down uh, and play hell on quality quite a bit. And, and not necessarily ruin your crop, but can definitely uh, change the flavor profile and change the crop yields completely in there. Uh, and that's why we have all throughout our farm, we have different 
different varieties on different soils uh, planted in different areas to mitigate some of those different issues that we might have uh, with 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 mother nature at certain times of the year uh, yeah and 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 those sugars and those flavors can be can be changed dramatically during those rainfalls that we could have in August and September and before we get too far you know Blake you can pick it up but I also want you all to talk about one of your as of this recording a very recent release that you have here as well just to kind of give another plug for the whiskey here well yeah um the one we actually bottled yesterday was our, so we've always did bottle and bond single barrels, but we've never came out with a true bottle and bond. And like I said, we blend multiple different vintages of whiskey together to make our Carl tea. So that takes us out of the bottle and bond since it wasn't a one distilling season. I mean, it was distilled either from this, that, and the other, um, and then multiple years. So we finally got really down and dabbled into what our flavor profile was. And we found this extraordinary lot of whiskey that we really, really loved. And it was balanced. It was complex. It had a little uh, spice to it. And it had a nice little nose to uh, the sweeter totes and the, the fruitiness that we went into it. Um, so this is the very first bottled and bond Carl tea that's a non-single barrel. Um, like I said, bottle and bonds being very, very popular, thrown around. The name is thrown around a lot. But for us... We wanted to wait. We did have four-year whiskey. We did. We can do any single barrel as bottled and bond. But for us, we wanted to come out with a blend that really, really shined above the rest um, and moving our Carl T into what would be a bottle and bond portfolio. So Also, I know we mentioned Carl T a few more times, so make sure people understand what Carl T is. Well, uh, historically, uh, we talked earlier uh, when we started about the production of alcohol here on the farm, and Carl T would be my grandfather. Uh, and prohibition, et cetera, that was the generation that really didn't get partake much in alcohol production. And historically, the Huber family are very much wine drinkers. Uh, and spirited choice a lot of times is actually gin. Uh, not whiskey, uh, and then brandy kind of fallen in there. But there's one generation that really stood out, and my father remembers stories of of winter time of taking the brandy still, and and Grandpa actually uh, producing uh, what he would describe as popcorn smelling whiskey. Uh, he was making bourbon back then. So one of the very few generations uh, of family that actually um, actually made bourbon, and historically. Uh, the only time that we actually could trace actual making bourbon here on the farm would be that generation, which would be Grandpa and Carl T. And uh, Carl Theodore is his actually name. So if you can tell Ted, I'm um, my middle name is yeah. So it's kind of a kind of a fun thing that uh, following Grandpa's footsteps here uh, through that. And my dad would uh, always talk about that particular thing. Because again, historically we were pretty much brandy producers, but that's our one little uh, toe in the water of of making whiskey with with that generation awesome so as we kind of wrap this up i've got kind of like one last fun question ted to to kind of throw to you and who's gunning for your job harder right now uh depends on what job it is they're both (laughs) gunning for different parts of the job right now so uh as you can tell there sounds like you got a few roles you could give up yeah i was about to say i was like it sounds at this point it sounds like you're in pretty good hands and one thing about uh transitional family businesses you always want to you know make sure there's enthusiasm and the education to back up that enthusiasm. And when we were looking into the next gen into this particular company, we didn't make sure that the boys really got the proper education. Uh, you know, they worked, they worked, you know, underneath of us pretty much since they were able to walk uh, and understand all aspects of fermentations, distillations, uh, agriculture and everything. But we wouldn't send them away to really learn uh, the true mechanics of what it takes to actually run a good functional distillery or winery. Uh, and so as far as who's gunning for what side of it, uh, you know, I'm going to let them fight it out in the next couple of years <laughs> of who, who ends up with what side here. So, Well, you'll taste the whiskey today. You can try our, my single barrels and my brother's single barrels. So you can kind of uh, see oh, the difference. Yeah there's, Face a, off. yeah, there's a definite difference uh, that Christian alluded to earlier that, you know, who, who's making what cut uh, and barrel pick and proof going into the barrel. There's a distinct difference. Uh, and we're doing, we, we, I'm sure that when we go taste barrels, uh, like we were yesterday in the warehouse, I don't like to know exactly everything that's going on in that barrel. I like to kind of more blind taste it. Yeah. Uh, and there's a definite signature of the three of us that I can pick up that it was done by the staff, uh, you know, on the day-to-day operations, or if it was a signature that one of the three of us, uh, we, we could pick it up pretty easy. 
Do you, like, have to, do you have to play fair with both of them? Like, I got to tell him I like three of his barrels and three of his. <laughs> no, I, 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 felt, like, I, I felt like there's a, like a chalkboard in the back. And after yeah. they get done with a pick, somebody just goes and like puts another one next to uh, next to their name or something like that. <laughs> no, no, all the family reserves so far that have been picked out has been all collaborated barrels, oddly enough. Uh, none of them, none of the families have come out with uh, one of the three of us yet. They would through brandy and uh, through the brandy side and the uh, uh, and the whiskey side and the wine side of it. So those really, really unique things that we released have been collaborated through the whole plant. Uh, now on single barrels, on the other hand, uh, there's definitely uh, my Christians and Blake's signature on certain single barrels that come out of the plant that are definitely our style. Well, this has been great. I mean, I think. I, I feel like we're almost cutting you short because I know. we've been talking for an hour and I mean, there's still so much more to talk about. So I've, I have a feeling that this will be continued for a part two in the future. Absolutely. Gosh, I'm like, my mind am blown right now. So much information to take in. That was great. Yeah, that's why we didn't write thesis on Oak. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's why we're picking it. You make it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, you know, Ted Christian Blake, I want to say thank you again for coming on, talking about Huber, talking about Starlight, uh, your background, the whiskey, everything's been fantastic. And, you know, we're really looking forward to you know, seeing more this whiskey, seeing more what's going to be distributed to. I know that you're working to even get it further out in more states in the United States. Uh, so I think a lot of people are going to be able to look forward to to trying this whiskey here in the very near future. So cheers again. Thank you for coming yeah, on the show. Thank you. thank you. Yeah, congratulations. Great, great job, guys. I mean, this is some really good stuff. And now I have something to do while my family goes pick pumpkins. I can sneak <laughs> off into the distillery in the warehouses. And then also, if anybody wants to find out more about Starlight and Huber, where do they find out about it? You can find us on Instagram at Starlight Distillery, Facebook at Starlight Distillery, or visit our website at www.starlightdistillery.com. Fantastic. And make sure you follow Bourbon Pursuit on all the social medias as well. You can also subscribe to us on every podcast outlet. And if you like the show, you want to help support us, find us on patreon.com slash Bourbon Pursuit as well. Yep. We got our work cut out for us. There's 4,000 different options out there. We got to go through and find one. So I'm excited. I think we can do it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Cheers, everybody. And we'll see you next week. 